presented uh, technology for a quarter at Politico Pro. Um, been had been with um, the Washington Post for years before that. So I'm going to leave it up to Steve. Great. Thank you all so much for coming out on a Friday afternoon. What's been a busy news week for us here in Washington. Um, I'm excited today. We're going to be talking about AI, automation, the gig economy, kind of what these terms mean and how they're impacting the ways we work. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm Stephen Overly. I'm a reporter with Politico, where I write about technology. Um, I'm joined up here. I'm going to give you their names and titles, but allow them to introduce themselves a bit more fully. We have Kristen Sharp, who's the executive director of SHIFT, the Commission on Work, Workers, and Technology. There's the Associate Vice President of Federal Affairs for the R Street Institute. Del Bianco, the Executive Director of Net Choice. So allow each of them to touch and, and their expertise here before we dive into some questions. Uh, good morning. Thanks very much for coming. Oh, can push. Good morning. Thanks very much for coming. Um, as Steve said, on a Friday. Kristen Sharp, I'm the Executive Director of SHIFT, the Commission on Work, Workers, and Tech. SHIFT is a joint project between the Think Tank New America, which is and focuses on um, a nonpartisan and um, innovative approach issues, and Bloomberg, the um, large data aggregator, formed about a year ago or so in order to look at the ways that artificial intelligence jobs available to people. Um, the past year, we conducted focus groups, surveys around the country in six cities, um, and looking at these issues work is is changing as a result of automation over the course of years. and we did so in a little bit of a different um, uh, methodology that we do um, in bringing together people to do economic scenario planning is sort of a future-based imaginative brainstorming session looking at what kinds of factors they see in both their own lives and experiences and the national trends that we're seeing um, changing uh, our sort of work structure and society on these things. And a couple of interesting things which we can talk about throughout the course of the um, of basically um, we've this this question of the pivot point in how automation and artificial intelligence is is the one that we found most crucial. So I'll leave it there for now. Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Um, so I'm Lori Sanders, the Associate Vice President affairs at the R Street Institute. So R Street is sort of a pragmatic libertarian think tank. We're a full service think tank, so we work on a broad variety um, of their issues. I feel like it brings together many of our different expertise and it makes information. So our tech team does a great amount of work on things like AI and the security implications and how we should um, regulatory structure should look like. We also do a fair amount of work on um, you know, and apprenticeships and the future of work, and this brings it all together. Um, and I think and keep it short, but thank you. Good afternoon. Executive Director of NetChoice. It's a trade association based here in Washington of e-commerce companies and uh, are dedicated to the simple proposition of trying to keep free enterprise and free expression. And that's harder than you would think it is. Uh, I'm I never worked on the Hill. I'm a businessman, I'm a serial entrepreneur, and I came to this field in the 90s. I had started a real estate online company called eReal. I had the audacity to show home buyers the listings, computers by the realtors. Well, the realtors in multiple cities sued us for cost. Who would think you could show consumers a home listing? And, and none of you, because you assume that a home buyer is going to see it all online. But it took Forty million dollars trying to do it to convince realtors that consumers engaged in the process without having to cut commission. So we could tell more. Of it taught me that there are barriers to e-commerce. There are barriers to barriers to competition, and to overcome those barriers, you have to be a fearless, which is the, which is the, which is really the role that I fill today. Great. Well, the first question I want to start with, and it may seem like a basic question, but I think it's important, is really around terminology. Because I think we hear artificial intelligence, we hear automation, we hear gig economy. 
thrown around a lot, sometimes used interchangeably, often used incorrectly. You know, I'm curious from your perspectives, particularly for our audience, how should we, how do you define and think about each of these terms, uh, particularly uh, from a policy perspective? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so automation is the um, systems that use data and connectivity in order to do a repetitive or routine task that um, that historically we have had tools to do. Um, artificial intelligence can encompass a number of different things from machine learning to um, other sort of neural connections. Um, and the gig economy is one that comes up really frequently as a question of who's covered and what's covered um, and can be anything from using a specific data platform to connect a, someone who wants to work with some source of income, um, which is the broadest definition, to you know various more specific things of just using it, um, something that has an app, or just using it um, for a service industry rather than something that is an asset as well. Um, so I think that it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, when people are thinking about how innovation in particular touches the gig economy or sharing economy, they are often referencing not just people with platforms, it, but all sort of independent contract workers, people who work in a, um, in a non-traditional way, not in a nine-to-five job with defined responsibilities, but anybody who is a graphic designer or someone who works on a project basis as well. And so I think that term in particular gets a little bit confused because it, it does actually mean using a platform to connect to income, but people do think of the gig economy as anybody who's, who's working on a computer basis. You know, it might be, const might be constructive to think where the, where the word gig came from. It was the 1930s, and it was a slang term developed for musicians and entertainers for when they would play at a party in a bar or a restaurant for a single evening. That was an engagement, and they shortened that to gig. So the gig has its origins in the same nature of what you just talked about, the notion of I'm just, I'm not going to come be your employee, I'm not going to move in and live here, I'm just going to show up and do a job, do a task for you, give it a show. <coughs> and that gig started that way. And while Gigs today could probably be expanded in any form of independent work. Is independent work. I guess it's anything other than being in a traditional employer-employee relationship. So independent work seems to be a broader definition of what that gig economy does. But lately, we think we've associated gig with automated platforms, which is ironic given that in 1930 there weren't any automated platforms around to get started. But the automated platforms do a lot more than just link workers with customers. That's only selling one third of the story. Over near the stack of sodas, I have a little three-fold brochure where Natural Choice kind of paints a broader picture of it because only one third of the trifecta is the gig or independent worker. The other third is the goods economy, people who make something innovative and creative, and they're tired of selling it at craft shows and fairs, so they go online and sell it on eBay and Etsy which were along, around, eBay along, around the long before Uber and Lyft. And a third platform would be the platform for assets. I've got a room in my house, or an entire house for a month, or a car I'm not using, an RV, a set of tools, a delivery van, and I want that asset to make money when I'm not using it, so I quote unquote share that asset through a platform. And those platforms have three or four characteristics, right? They're Automated platform that has a two-sided market that links providers with customers. That's a two-sided market. Platform sits in the middle. It often deploys itself on uh, mobile devices. It takes advantage of the network effect that the more suppliers you have, the more it's valuable to the customers, and vice versa. And it almost always has a peer-to-peer -peer rating system where customers can rank providers and rate their service, and where even providers can rate their customers. And those characteristics brought together, I think, put a better definition on gig being a small part of a bigger picture as opposed to a be all end all term that captures all three. Well, I want to start um, with automation if I could. I think that's sort of 
you know, in some ways becoming a bit of a boogeyman, right? We think of robots coming to take our jobs. There was a, a recent McKinsey report, though, that said based on current technology, about 5% of jobs could be completely automated, and 60% of jobs could be partially automated, meaning some task that a human is currently doing could be done by a machine. You know, how, is, is a, I guess on a basic level I'm asking, is automation something we need to be afraid of? Is it replacing human workers at this point? Or, or how does it how does it change the workforce if more tasks are automated? I mean, that's a good question, right? Whether whether we need to be afraid of this or whether automation and artificial intelligence create new opportunities for people. Um, and I think that both things are true, and that they can be true simultaneously. We we will have some uh, jobs and some parts of jobs and some industries that are changed dramatically as a result of these things. And we will also have a number of emerging opportunities that we either haven't yet identified or haven't yet kind of developed the vocabulary to talk about effectively. Um, and thinking about that, that's partly a narrative question of how do you how do you think about and um, imagine what the jobs of the future are. I mean, yes, you, I think you cited 10 years ago, um, nobody knew that the job of app designer, which we now have a competition for, was a thing. Um, and you know, 10 years ago, similarly, we didn't, we, if you had asked someone whether they, um, if, you had, if you had tried to describe what we now call cybersecurity, it would have been some combination of, well, IT security plus looking at um, what kinds of emerging threats are out there and how they might impact our country's security, um, how they might interact with national security. We didn't have a vocabulary for that. And now that's a job description too of a cybersecurity analyst. So thinking about some of the emerging jobs and the emerging opportunities and what those things, how we how we frame and how we talk about those things is a is a you know, I think there's lots of opportunity that we haven't um, been able to imagine yet, and so it scares people more than it otherwise could. Um, I do think, though, that we, the, the main problem with automation is that there is a potential mismatch between the time frame of the jobs or parts of jobs that might be automated and the time frame of figuring out what the emerging jobs are and figuring out how to match people's skills to those things. So if, if there was sort of a way to characterize that gap, that's how I would characterize it. Yeah, I mean, I think that hits on the, the most important point. I mean, I am, um, perhaps it's my sort of free market leanings, right, but I'm an optimist about this stuff. You know, I'm, I have a 10-year-old son, and I'm incredibly excited at the idea that, you know, 20 years from now, he might have the coolest job in the world that I can't even possibly imagine right now. Um, that said, I have a lot of worries, right, about that displacement period, and it's something we need to take really seriously. You know, I would definitely encourage you to pick up one of Steve's brochures because in it, they, he highlights a, a number of things that I think are, are barriers that stand in the way of easing that displacement pain, right? And that's really what we should be focused on, not, you know, robot taxes or anything else that I would think is a little bit insane of a, of a reaction, because we want to embrace technology. We want people to increase productivity in the economy so that we're all richer, so that people can do jobs that we've never thought of. But, you know, things like um, completely onerous occupational licensing or barriers to starting small businesses, those are the types of things that are going to hold people back that need to move into, you know, something new in the workforce, even if it's not necessarily the job of tomorrow, they need some paper right now. So whether it's really think about how we retrain people or, yeah, allowing people to take up opportunities for themselves, I think those are small steps that we can take to ease that thing without necessarily doing something that stops the flow of, you know, the increased automation that I think we actually do want to see. And Steve, describe this to me. Should we fear it? Growing up in the early 60s, we feared nuclear war with the Soviet Union. That was fear, right? I don't think this is about fear as much as it's about anticipation and preparation. Because it's coming. Anytime a business can reduce costs or improve quality by employing capital to replace labor, count on it. Count on it. Don't be afraid of it. Understand it and realize it'll happen at every turn. You know, you talked about a 10-year-old son, and I have a son in medical school, and I've watched what they go through to diagnose people that present in a doctor's office with the emergency room. 
And it's obvious that an awful lot of that diagnosis, what's the next test to run, what question to ask, an awful lot of that can be automated. And if it learns over time based on the responses, then it's artificially intelligent. And artificial intelligence is an extension of just what we do with automation. It's natural to be there. And uh, I can tell you, my, my son fears the reimbursement hassle and angry moms a lot more than he fears automation getting in the way of doing what he wants to do as a doctor. If a computer can help you do your job, whether it's being a doctor, scheduling the next task you want to fulfill, or booking a ride, finding a home to use in a city where the hotels are booked, those are tasks for which automation is going to help you either to make money or to spend your money better. But I, I don't know that fear is really where you want to begin the conversation. Well, I'm glad you mentioned robot taxes. We will come back to those. Um, but, you know, I think where some of the, you know, whether you call it fear or anticipation, anxiety, I think some of where it stems from for people is the idea that anytime you have these big economic transformations, you often see sort of winners and losers, right? Those who are left behind, those who have some sort of advantage. Um, and that can be determined by education, geography, industry, a number of different factors. Who will be the winners and who will be the losers in this economic shift? Do we, you know, do we even know that clearly at this point? And, and if we do, how do we account for that as we prepare for, for this kind of change? That is a fantastic question. Um, so I think, I mean, in general, you can paint with broad strokes, right, to say that the you know, winners are people or that the winners will be people that are able to figure out how to navigate that landscape, right? And that's sort of an intangible skill. It doesn't have to be somebody who's already super rich. It could be somebody anywhere, really, along the economic spectrum. However, right, it does raise questions about how we think about education, how we prepare children, how we prepare young adults. How, um, you know, what, what do we teach them that is important to learn, right? Is it important for them simply to, you know, get this broad liberal arts education where they then have some skills and very specific skills, or is it important to teach them how to learn and teach them that they need to be learning throughout their lifetime, right? Um, so in, in um, I think, yeah, a lot of it depends, frankly, on how we think about training our own attitudes about how we engage in the future of work, not necessarily, um, you know, there being a preset class, I mean, it's always easy to say that, sure, a lot of this has to do with capital and capital accumulation, and in that sense, people who are able to accumulate the capital or already have it will, will certainly be winners. Um, but what I'm excited about in all of this is that I think it unleashes a ton of new opportunities, right? And it's just a matter of retraining how we think, getting out of that mindset that, you know, I'm going to do this exact thing for the next 40 years or whatever, and thinking about constantly adjusting and you know upskilling yourself to be ready for what's next. Yeah, with respect to the loser, think of it in two areas. If if you're in a profession acting as an intermediary, being disintermediated is one of one of the internet's favorite capabilities. Uh, Intermediaries like auctioneers do a lot less once eBay unable somebody to sell their stuff. Intermediaries like real estate agents have to find a way to add value to the transaction because simply printing it off and handing you a list to go see was not really adding value. Um, optometrists are going to love this, but it took an act of Congress to force optometrists to turn over your contact lens prescription so you could buy your lenses wherever you want. I kid you not. In the 1990s, it took an act of Congress because optometrists would withhold the prescription so that you had to buy the lenses from them and private label lenses with certain markup. So if you're an intermediary, you have a lot to be concerned about and you need to add value in other ways. The other side is that putting intermediaries out of the picture, if you're a provider of a service or a good and you're insulated from competition with respect to the prices or the quality of what you offer, and if you're insulated from competition, you really need to open, open your eyes to all sides, since competition will enter through the platforms that my industry is able to create. And people are hungry for opportunities to make extra money with their time, with their assets, with their skills. And I think that that means that the losers will be folks who aren't watching out for competition that could arrive from some place they never expected it to come. So I agree with all of those things, and and 
do think that we're moving more towards a world where individuals have to take on more risk. They have to they have to find opportunities for themselves, figure out how to add value in them, um, seek out new ways to to <coughs> be entrepreneurial in their jobs. That that is true, and that's the way the world's going. Um, but at the same time, when you ask people in focus groups, in one-on-one -on -one conversations, in surveys, what they want in a job, the number one thing that people <coughs> say across all income levels, across all geographic locations, across all demographies, um, is they want stability. They want to be paid on the 1st and 15th of every month. And they want to know that they can plan going forward what their income is going to be and how they can advance in their, their job. And so I think while, it's, while we absolutely have to empower people to be able to take advantage of, of new opportunities, we also need to be thinking about the fact that all of our constituents and all of our friends and family are worried about the fact that taking on too much risk can be hard, and, and people are, we need to make sure that people are equipped to do that. Well, I think that's a, if, if I could add, what goes around comes around again. And a hundred years ago, nearly all Americans worked for small businesses, and many worked for their own small business. What was the primary profession in America hundred years ago? It was farming. You were a farm laborer or a farmer taking huge risks. You were working in other professions doing services for which small businesses led, and the sense of risk was, was ridiculously difficult compared to what we have today. Now, in between of those hundred years, we had the industrialization of our economy, creating lots of 40-hour a week full-time jobs in manufacturing centers closer to cities. And it was a good run. It was an awfully good run for 75 years. But those jobs are, are diminishing in, the, in their growth, and they're disappearing entirely from some regions of the country. So the, the quest we have for that 40 hour a week job that could last 25 years, the stability of the twice a month paycheck and maybe even benefits is, is elusive and yet I understand that it's attractive. Wouldn't we all love to have it? But because it's less uh, available now, it may turn out that we should be positive and optimistic and explore ways in which some of these, you know, some of these technological innovations could actually create the opportunities for them to have more. You talked about what they asked for, what they said in their survey. So McKinsey in October surveyed 8,000 people in the U.S. and half a dozen European countries and asked uh, how many of them engaged in this independent work, regardless of whether they use an internet platform, just independent work. And they said uh, 160 million people are a third of working age population in the U.S. and five European countries. And only 15% of them are using a digital platform. So we've only just begun to see that impact. But to Kristen's point, 30%, a third of those who are free agents, choose actively to be an independent worker. And they reported to McKinsey significantly higher satisfaction than do workers with traditional jobs that pay you on the 15th and 30th of the month. So sometimes what you want is a function of what you don't have, and there are a significant portion of the workforce that enjoys being a free agent, with or without the internet. That's not actually what I was saying. Um, I, I wasn't saying that we need to stay with the current setup of how we do work, where everybody works for someone else and does a, a specific set of responsibilities for a specific pay, and gets paid on the first and 15th of every month. I'm saying that's what people said that they wanted. And if people are very clear that they would like to have stability, we need to make sure that we're employing the mechanisms for training people in new ways of thinking, if, we, if, if people want to go into new opportunities, and that we're providing, we're using the technology and the things that are available to us now to provide new approaches and avenues to stability. It doesn't mean that everybody has to stay in a nine to five job forever if that doesn't work for the new economy, but it means that we have to keep in mind that both of those things need to be true at the same time, that we want to empower people to take risks while acknowledging that there has to be some new mechanism for being able to forward plan. Well, and I want to ask then, um, you know, Traditionally, there have been a lot of protections for in, in the labor market, right? A lot of those come from Congress, right? Come from federal policy. As we have, you know, enter this new economy and we sort of balance 
the need for innovative ways of making money with the stability that employees see. <coughs> what role is there for government in that? What does what is what policy do we shape to create those mechanisms you mentioned that allow people to be entrepreneurial but also you know have somewhat of a safety net? So I think the one of the most important things we could do is, you know, one of the reasons that that security matters that you get from your employer is that it does come with, it's where your benefits come from, right? It's where your health insurance comes from, your disability, your ability to plan for, for the future. And so at Arch Street, we've spent a lot of time thinking about what a different worker status could look like. Um, so we've, so right now, if you're an independent contractor that you work for yourself, you have to figure out how to procure your own benefits. Whereas if you are an employee, like all of you here on the hill, or me with our street, right, I get all of that through my employer. And the problem for you know the Ubers, the Lyfts, the um, Etsy's is that there is um, if they were to offer those things, right, then it would trigger that employer threshold. And if it triggers that employer threshold, then the people who went into those platforms seeking that flexibility would lose it, right? It changes everything about how they work, and changes everything about this company's business models. Um, but what if there was a way that you could have that and you could have the benefits too? Um, and so I think it's, um, you know, this is maybe just my inner libertarian coming out, right? But this is what happens when you have government set up a labor structure that we all live with for a really, really long time. And then technology comes along and says, wow, this isn't working anymore and we can do something different. And so I think it's incredibly important for Congress to figure out what that new structure could look like. Because this is a great thing about these platform companies, right, is you see them wanting to step in and provide some of those things, right, that we traditionally see as being associated with employers. They want to provide that, and those are things that, you know, independent contractors in the past would not have had someone willing to offer them because they were all on their own. And so if we could figure out a way that you can have flexible benefits, you know, we've talked about um, whether you want to create, you know, sort of a mutual benefit exchange that's similar to insurance brokers where you could access benefits as a gig worker. Um, you could create, I mean, this could be take a form that looks frankly more like a union or a guild where you go to access your benefits. There's tons of different ways it could be structured and we, you know, want to, of course, encourage as much flexibility as possible when figuring out, you know, and experimenting and what that structure should look like. Um, but allowing people to get that stability, whether it's, you know, creating new things like wage insurance that you can buy into with your benefit provider or, you know, things of that nature that allow you to um, have some of the stability while also enjoying the flexibility is, I think, one important first step that Congress could and should take. Stephen, it's a great question, and uh, it's what government can do, but it isn't always Congress. But it often starts here. It often starts the conversation in the halls where you work today. The, the third page, the last leaf of the brochure that's over there, lists 11 things that you can do, governments and courts, to help to facilitate entrepreneurial and personal economic opportunities. And to go over a few of them, uh, Federal Trade Commission Chair Maureen Olhausen has an economic liberty initiative. What's that about? It's a great speech if you haven't heard Maureen give it. And she focuses on examples where occupational licensing laws at the state and local level, while they may have been erected to do consumer protection, are being used for competition prevention today. Very good examples of uh, in Louisiana, where you can't put two flowers in a vase unless you're licensed to be a florist. Occupational licensing laws for people that want to make a few dollars a day doing hair braiding, but can't if the state and local government is enforcing rules that beauticians claim that hair braiding is something that ought to be regulated. So there are areas that the Federal Trade Commission can take as things that are unfair, deceptive trade practices and in, in, in barriers to progress. Well, but think about Lori's notion of shining a bright light on portable benefits. Think about trying to insulate entrepreneurs from the reach of out-of-state regulators and out-of-state tax collectors. Um, someone who's develop the capability of making a really unique hair braid and now sells it on Etsy, could find herself subject to 10,000 different tax jurisdictions in 46 different states, claiming that it's a tax owed when she sells to their consumers. The Representative Sensor Director here in the House has a bill that I'm certain he's going to introduce in the next couple of weeks that says no taxation, no regulation without representation. That's something that's squarely in Congress's ambit to consider whether state regulators or tax authorities ought to be able to reach across their borders to businesses that have no presence in that state at all. That's an area that can make a difference. We should also do things we should invest in 
physical infrastructure to support digital infrastructure. We should try to help small businesses in tax regulation and think about investing in workforce retraining and skills building. And those are just some of the items on that list. There's something in this list for everyone. And many times there are initiatives that people have already been enforcing. But now those initiatives can contribute to an environment where personal economic opportunity is something we are fostering because it does bring more risk. It does bring less security and stability. So by God, let's get rid of the barriers to that opportunity so that people are compensated for the extra risks that they take. Well, and I want to ask, you know, following up on that and, and hear from you all, what, as we have this economic shift, because some of these arguments and suggestions are certainly things we, we've heard before that have been advocated before, what would be sort of, what, what's changed or what's new as a result of, of this incoming wave of automation and AI? Um, you know, Lori mentioned earlier this idea of taxing robots, right? That is, as a way to supplement the lost tax revenue from fewer workers, we tax machines. Or there's also been um, proposed this idea of universal basic income, right? Where the government provides sort of a, a salary to, to its citizens. You know, those are some of the ideas floated out there. I know not necessarily completely popular uh, with everyone here, but what, what are some of the new ideas that we need to be thinking about brought on by this kind of economic shift? I mean, I think the biggest has to do with, with revamping the education and training system. And that if you're thinking about what, I actually think most of the policies that we should put in place initially are from the ground up and are based in communities or in startups that are, that are working on new things. Um, but if you're talking about things at the federal level, then thinking, rethinking the one and done model that we have right now for our whole education system. Right now, almost everybody studies something in either high school or college and then expects to use that information for most of the rest of their career um, and, or most of the rest of the industry that they work in forever afterwards. And if we're moving to a situation where people will have to identify and use new skills on a regular basis, then we've got to have a system that, that helps people train or retrain either within their company or industry or you know, between different companies and industries on a more regular basis than we have right now. Yeah, I actually completely agree. I'm very frustrated by the sort of talk of a robot tax or a, a VBI because I think they're just band-aids on, on the problem, right? We want people to be participating. We want people to be earning their success. We don't want to just, you know, throw, you know, some money at, at the problem or try to stop automation from coming. So I completely agree that education and training is, is where it's at, right? There's, um, you know, so in my home state of Georgia, the most in-demand career right now is welding and predictably will be for sort of the next little bit. That's not something that's going to be automated. And yet, most people go get a four-year degree that never teaches them how to do something like weld, right? And so allowing people and, you know, incentivizing people, moving people towards the model of, you know, you can get a six-week certificate in welding that will get you started. You can move up from there. It's, you know, the skills are applicable in other sort of manufacturing settings. And so, you know, there are, whether it's thinking about six-week certificates or I know there are um, some tech companies experimenting with what they call micro degrees that allow people to learn a basic skill really quickly and get a foothold in the tech workforce. Um, those are the types of ideas we need to be thinking about, not you know, stopping the automation wave or anything. I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, PA, yeah, worked at a steel mill, and uh, steel was the industry that drove Western Pennsylvania. 18 years ago, the very last mill closed. There's not a single scrap of steel being made in Pittsburgh today. And things are not rosy in Pittsburgh. I know we talked about it in the media when President Trump compared Pittsburgh to Paris, but Pittsburgh did try to undergo a bit of a transformation. It was to try to find industries other than steel where there was an opportunity to succeed. They took advantage of the universities that they have and promote economic development around automation and robotics. How do you know? Took advantage of the universities and hospitals they had and built a healthcare industry. So no, Pittsburgh is not the envy of all cities by any means, and I certainly don't live there anymore. But it's an example that a city has to take proactive measures to help to foster industries, and that is a level above the level of training workers to have certain skills. It's sort of to do both, and economic development ends up being really important. Now it's difficult to pick winners and losers, but it's that 
it's not that hard to say that healthcare and uh, robotics are certainly going to employ more people than steel in a city like Pittsburgh. So I think we all have to contribute to that conversation. And sorry to jump back in, but I do want to push back a little bit against the notion, right, that because we're facing a new problem, it must mean we need a new solution, <coughs> if that makes sense. Um, so I think that the technological changes actually sort of unveil what were fundamental problems with our workforce to begin with. It was always a problem that we had so much occupational licensing. It was always a problem that we had this crazy education system. It was always a problem that we have, you know, onerous regulation of small businesses and difficulty for access to capital, right? It's just now it's more of a problem than ever before, right? Because things are changing. And so if it's more of a problem than ever before, then perhaps we do need to finally pass some of those tried and true solutions that we've identified for a really long time and then see what happens when the dust settles from there and we freed up the marketplace and people have more opportunity. There certainly are, I think, new solutions like a flexible worker status, portable benefits. Those are things that would be new, although they've been you know, discussed to some extent. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I would much rather um, get rid of the problems that we've created over time that are now exacerbated by technology and then try to come up with something new and crazy and different that just goes government work. Let's make it easy for people to try something new. It's very difficult to get retrained and they can try that. But there are many people that are good at something and they might want to try making some money at it. There are plenty of homemakers with a spare bedroom when the kids move away and they might want to rent those spare bedrooms out during high school graduation, college graduation weekends on Airbnb. Let's make it easy to do that. Make sure that Airbnb can cover the registration so that that person doesn't have to register the home. Let Airbnb cover the taxes and regulatory compliance. This is an example of trying to step in and prevent the localities from disallowing, over-regulating, or, or, or literally prohibiting somebody from renting a room in their own house. Uh, if somebody's interested in repairing cars, they ought to be able to try TaskRabbit or Thumbtack and be able to do that. They ought to be able to rent those cars to other people once they've repaired them. Now, there are barriers in New York State. You can't do that. You can't rent your car a car you fixed up or a car you're not using. And so many times it's the incumbent industries who have been successful at capturing the regulatory structure to suggest that to protect consumers, we can't allow this guy to be able to rent that car or this woman to do hair braiding in her spare time. And if they're the taxi industry, we can't allow people to be driving for Lyft and Uber unless we fingerprint them and certify them as a driver's licenses and force them to buy a taxi medallion. And that's a fight that is ongoing. This, this war is not remotely over. There's still 50 cities in this country where Lyft and Uber cannot operate legally for Uber X and Lyft. So it's an ongoing problem. Great. Well, we are going to open up to audience questions. So if you, if you do have a question, you know, please, uh, I guess we'll maybe do the raise your hand model. Um, start in the back. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know who can answer my question out of the panel, but as of right now, um, pretty much every major company, like Uber, Google, Apple, are investing billions and billions of dollars in like, driverless cars, right? Like, we're all aware of this. Um, but projections show that like 2020 to like 2030, they're going to be able to like have <coughs> technology, right? Um, in 29 out of 50 states, truck driving is the largest profession, right? So when it becomes safer and much more profitable for truck companies to be using these driverless trucks, how would that industry adjust? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we actually ran focus groups in the Midwest as part of the Shift Commission with truckers, um, both delivery vehicle truckers and long haul, um, and asked that question of sort of what do people think about the technology coming down the pike, and are they um, prepared to, to use it, work with it, um, you know, respond to it. And I think that there's a potential problem there because many of the truckers that we spoke to thought that it was a much longer time horizon than that. Thought that it was a time horizon somewhere between 40 and 80 years where we would have um, prevalent um, automated vehicles. And so that, that, that's a real question. Um, I think within the trucking industry in particular, they think that there will be a lot of opportunities for people to work with the technologies. There will be, you know, there will be both a need for if the automated vehicles are on the road faster, longer, for more hours, there will be more mechanic-related jobs to service them. 
um, and there will be people who are sort of dispatchers and, and you know, looking at where the fleets of trucks are going and things like that. So there's certainly an amount of retraining for the existing population of people who understand the trucking industry. Um, but, you know, the, the question of other options for people, that's, that's what I meant earlier in the conversation and talking about between the mismatch between what things will be automated quickly and how and when the new jobs are emerging. Uh, and so that's, that's a question we'll really need to think about. Your statistics were good. You said so many states it was number one drop in truck driving. But as a nation, the number one, the single largest profession for American men is driving. Not just trucks, it could be delivery vans, taxi, other forms of driving. It's the number one profession today for American men, those that participate in the workforce, that is. And I, I think that the specter of having so much of that disappear is what I brought up very early when I suggested that if you're providing a service and you're insulated from price and quality competition today, you really have to be the most vigilant for how automation and the internet are going to disrupt your ability to do that. I guess the good news for truckers, though, is that somebody still has to load and unload that truck. And so I, uh, I don't know how that truck does it without a person who's involved in it, but there's going to be an absolute necessity to really examine closely where you're adding value to this transaction. You can't just be the behind the wheel. It's going to take more than that. Um, it seems to be something all of you guys are mentioning or it's just right at the side of the screen about education and being able to change the model towards something where people are continuously able to reevaluate their skills and then therefore able to change occupation to be able to kind of shift and have flexibility. I'm curious if you guys have some particular examples where you've seen a little bit of traction or good quality, things like Khan Academy or things like that. Yeah, that's a great question too. Uh, there are a huge number of education tech startups that are looking at this in different ways. Um, you know, everything from from sort of online business courses and accounting courses to things that are uh, much more tactical than that. Um, there's uh, overall though the the sort of general concept of how do you um, how do you make it stable so that people can make those investments in themselves? It, and a lot of the pilot programs that have been the most effective have been ones where companies at the local level have said to, have, have identified the skills that they need to hire for and the jobs that they could potentially provide and then recruited people specifically based on soft skills, you know, like people who are loyal employees, people who, you know, show up on time and are responsible for work and trained them in those skills even if they did not have a base in those skills, um, but that they paid them up front to take the four week or four month long course and guaranteed at the end of it that if they successfully completed the course, they would be hired. And then worked with other members of the local community to say, you know, we're gonna be, we're hiring these people, we've committed to it, so let's figure out a way to ensure that the you know that the community also supports this business by by um, employing new people in different ways. And that those people have been particularly millennials who have student debt, people have been really reluctant to invest in a $2,000 or $15,000 course without knowing that there was a, a real opportunity for them at the end of it. So the things that have worked in a lot of ways have been identifying that there is an opportunity to use those new skills and be hired for them at the end of it. Yeah, I, so I completely agree that it's a lot of the success seems to be in the very employer-driven models. Um, I think it's very interesting that you know as we sort of see the decline in private sector union participation, right, which is traditionally a big place that people would go to get those skills. You know, I mean, I'm a free marketer. I have many thoughts that are positive about the decline in the unions, but that doesn't change the fact that there are some important services that the union provided, right? It's sort of a quality assurance training model. And as that's you know declined, there hasn't necessarily been you know something that stepped in to fill that gap, right? And so I do think that it's a place where employers need to take a bit more responsibility, that whether it's partnering with their local community and technical colleges, getting people trained on machines that they will use in, you know, while they're actually in employment. 
Um, one thing we haven't really touched on, and um, it's more sort of just a, a broad point too, is we, you know, in all of this conversation, tech gets a really bad rap, right? It's automation, it's AI, it's everything coming down the pipe. It's gonna destroy all of the jobs, right? But in some ways, tech and, um, you know, emerging technologies really stand to change the way in which we provide education, right? And so, I, you know, we don't know what that answer is right now, right? But I'm really excited about the possibilities that, you know, now people who traditionally would have struggled to get to an educational institution can learn in their home. You know, maybe people who struggle with disability can learn using virtual reality, right? I think it opens the doors for how we train and educate and allow people to work just as much as it can close them. We just need to think creatively about that as technology evolves. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, one is sort of the dual standard. So, you know, I love Uber, but I also recognize that Uber drivers have less of a burden than these taxi companies. Uh, so we have a separate kind of regulatory authority which governs the old industries, and then we have fewer regulations on the newer industries, which strikes me as unfair if, you know, you're, playing, you're in the same job, you shouldn't be having the same rules. And then the second question has to do with health care. Um, traditionally, most Americans get their uh, health care through their employer. Obviously, that's not as possible under the gig economy. What does that say about the government's responsibility in terms of either single-payer health care or subsidized health care or some way to make sure that people who are in the gig economy can still be taken care of? Hey, Larry. Nice to see you again. On the first question of dual standard, there's a slight misunderstanding. A taxi gets a medallion and is given an exclusive license to pick people up when they raise their hand in a corner. In most airports, they're the only ones that can get into that line to pick up a visitor moving from out of town. So we have a system, an old system that's evolved in the taxi medallion where they restrict the supply of taxis to be able to support the income of the taxi drivers by selling those medallions. And there are many drivers who make a living driving a taxi. In every city where Lyft and Uber live, no Lyft or Uber can ever pick anybody up who simply raises their hand and yells at. It is a different business. It's not new. The way Uber got started was limo drivers. We've had limo drivers as long as we've had taxis. They, they don't pick people up at the curb. And the original Uber Black was really just limo drivers. They had commercial driver's licenses that were fingerprinted. The real innovation was UberX and Lyft, the notion that somebody could use a few hours a day of spare time when the kids are at school and drive. A part-time student who could drive from the theater. And they're not picking people up. The regulatory structures are different because the services are fundamentally different. There are entire areas of this country where there are no taxi cabs at all. And in those areas, Lyft and Uber are the only way that somebody gets the drive to Walmart to pick up our groceries once a week. There are differences there. You mentioned healthcare portability. I'm with you. But I'm not going to sit here and say the only way to guarantee healthcare access and affordability is single payer. I, I have no idea if that's the avenue to get there. But let me agree with you that for this to work, we need portable and accessible and affordable benefits. We thought that ACA, or whatever it is that ACA might become in the future, is supposed to make sure that somebody can get healthcare coverage with pre existing conditions or without. So I'm with you on that. Well, I want to wrap up on time, but I want to end with one uh, question for the panel, <clears throat> which is, you know, if I'm a lawmaker right here, how do I know if my constituents are especially vulnerable to automation, to AI, to these changes that are coming? And what should be sort of my, my first step, whether that's a question that I ask myself or, or a policy I start to explore to, to address that coming shift? Hmm. That's a big question. Um, I think probably the, the key factors on whether your population is uh, at risk for automation is um, the number of people in routine-based jobs, um, jobs that have repetitive tasks as the basis of their, um, of their responsibilities. And the more jobs you have of that type, um, probably the more quickly you'll, you'll see some type of automation. Um, and what to do about it is start working at the community level immediately. Start trying to forward plan with the, you know, the cities and communities and regions in your area to to think about, you know, what kind of of um, what kind of work 
do people in your area want to do? What kind of work does your city or um, region want to attract to the region? And then how can you use all the resources, social entrepreneurs, um, new businesses, and accelerators and incubators that help promote people into new businesses and you know public-private partnerships between community colleges or, or um, even private sector training organizations to start identifying the skills that you'll need in your area and um, getting processes for people to get connected to them. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, thinking creatively about the anchor institutions that you already have, are you fully taking advantage of them, whether it's hospitals or universities, are they investing in the communities in the right way to create the, you know, the jobs that um, will you know, see your constituents through? Um, and then figuring out, um, yeah, how to, how to work the training, how to get people, um, you know, stable and steady in the workforce. But yeah, I mean, I think Kristen's exactly right. Yeah, the lens to look at is that businesses will spend money capital to reduce the cost or improve the quality of the services and products they make. It's inevitable. It's, it's, it's the nature of, of, of humanity. It's what we will do. And given that that's happening, you have to examine whether the cost or quality of the work that's being done by people in your district is subject to being undermined through competition, innovation, and investment. And it isn't just the people we dislocate, it's the people that aren't working today. You could be a downer, but Nicholas Everstadt or an AEI wrote a book called uh, Men Without Work. And I commend you all to uh, at least read the summary on Amazon.com. He suggests that right now we have 11 million American men of working age who aren't even in the workforce. They're not in the denominator at all. They're discouraged, they're not working. Half of them are on disability payments of some kind, not enough to live on. And they spend half of their waking hours on television or on a computer. They're not even participating in the workforce. Now, I don't know what amount of worker retraining brings them back in, but if they can fix up a car, fix up a bedroom, uh, they can uh, drive for lift and Uber for a while. I'd love to see them start to participate, and this is why I mentioned earlier, let's make it easy to start participating, even if we don't imagine it's going to produce a full-time, twice-a-month paycheck along the way. So one other thing that I just plug is, um, I brought a couple copies of the Shift Commission report on four futures of work. So it's, it's a 20 year forward look on what what might be four potential ways that we'll be working. Um, and so they're out on the front table if anybody wants them. Um, when I worked on the hell I never ever would have read a 30 page report. No. So but she, she is uh, page 16 and 17 has a chart of what the four futures are and what the criteria for like sort of the triggers of whether we're getting to those things are. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you all for spending the lunch hour here to uh, discuss these topics. And, uh, until next time. Thank you. Thank you.